I'd like to thank Chancellor Perlman, Vice Chancellor Paul, and the Research Council for inviting me to give this lecture. As you've just heard, I spend much of my time looking at mud. And so as somebody that has that rather unglamorous pursuit, I'm very honored to be asked to give this lecture today. I'd also like to thank my colleagues in my departments and also in the Water Initiative, as well as colleagues across campus, for providing such a supportive and stimulating place in which to do research. I've really enjoyed my eight years at UNL, and I think this is a superb research university. I'd also like to acknowledge Angie Fox. She's an illustrator at the State Museum. She's the one that helped me put together many of the images that you're going to see today, and I couldn't have done it without her. So like most academic endeavors, um, this, pro this research projects that I'm going to talk to you about today are the product of many hours of work by many people, not just myself. My research career started with Herb Wright, who's my advisor for my PhD. He's a member of the National Academy of Sciences, which you might not be able to tell from that particular image, but he uh, is indeed a very distinguished scholar. He just celebrated his 90th birthday a few weeks ago, and he's strong and still out in the field. So Herb was one of the first great interdisciplinary environmental scientists, and so he taught all of us to think broadly about how the environment worked. Equally importantly, he also taught us how to sort of generate an involved research lab, and he had many people from all over the world that would come to the university and visit us. He had seminars at his house. He had potluck suppers. We discussed many things about science over cookies and tea. My own style might be for something more like beer. But nonetheless, he really was great at fostering an interactive research culture, and I think I have learned a lot from him about how I'd like to style my own research group, and I think many of us have benefited from that. I've also had fabulous colleagues throughout the years, but I have two here that have, been, have played a particular role in my career. Dan Engstrom, up on the left, uh, was a graduate student with me. He's now at the Science Museum of Minnesota. But we started working together in the Great Plains on climate history shortly after each getting our PhDs. And so the work that you'll see today, he involved with me initially. We worked in Alaska together and many other far-flung places. And while we aren't actively collaborating today, we do still share many stories about how the world works and about life in general. My colleague Paul Baker is at Duke University. He's a geochemist, and he invited me about 15 years to work in the tropical Andes with him, and he's sort of helped me to expand my perspective into larger scale systems and broader time frames. And so both of these individuals are people that have had a long-term association with me in generating exciting research and have had big influences about how I think on the world. Of course, all the work really gets done by the graduate students that are in my lab and the postdocs as well. So I've had a wonderful suite of people throughout the years, many of whom are pictured in these particular shots. So these are the people that take my ideas and evolve them into the exciting science that I hope to present to you today. So my basic thesis is simply that understanding the history of the environment is important. So environmental history is intrinsically interesting, but I think there's several other reasons for studying the long-term history of the environment. First of all, it provides us with a really critical perspective on the modern condition of the landscape. So we all observe the landscape around us. We observe trends in climate. We observe the seemingly delayed us that we've just had, the raging forest fires in the west, the hurricanes that are hitting the Gulf Coast, the nutrient enrichment of our streams. And we evaluate whether or not these conditions are extreme or unusual based on our experience. And I would argue that the case of evaluating it based on simply the 20th century is a very short-term perspective and that we need to extend our frame of reference to something considerably longer than the 20th century to understand whether these conditions are unusual or extreme. So this is just a little cartoon to illustrate that point. So you can see a trend in this particular top image. That trend, when viewed in the context of a certain period of time, might seem to be a departure from usual conditions. But if you evaluate that trend on a longer time frame, you can see in this example that it's part of a cyclic or recurrent um, part of history. Again, I would argue that in order to understand our modern day landscape, we need a longer term perspective than simply the 20th century. Another important reason 
thing the past is that it allows us to understand how the landscape works in on time scales we see and in ways that are twentieth century. So quite simply the compass the whole variety of ways in which the world can evolve and exist. So this is simply an example of that. This is a set of climate predictions from a climate model that's um, increased greenhouse gas concentrations. So this model takes anticipated scenarios of greenhouse gas concentrations for the 21st century. It then predicts the climate based on those greenhouse gas concentrations. This upper scenario is for a higher level of CO2. This lower scenario is for a lower level of CO2, again, for the 21st century. What these modelers have then done is they've taken the predicted um, climate of various locations on the globe for the 21st century and then asked the question, to what extent do the predicted climates resemble climates that we've seen in the last century, in the 20th century? And so in these figures, colors that are dark blue are, are, are predicted climates that are very similar to things that we've known within the last century. But as we move into lighter shades of blue and into the warm colors, we're seeing predicted climates for the future which do not have any analogs. In other words, they don't resemble things in the, in the climate variability of the last century. And so regardless of specific um, predictions are right, the general idea is probably quite true, that we're likely moving into an environmental state and environmental systems that are very different than those that we know, very different than those that we've experienced within the last century. And so I would argue that in order to better enable us ourselves to deal with those unexpected future conditions, we need to study the past. So what I'm going to do, I would argue, first of all, that those kinds of perspectives are, are useful for most environmental conditions. So we can look at um, erosion rates. We can look at all sorts of environmental conditions with this long temporal perspective. But what I'm going to be talking about today is climate variability, specifically precipitation variation. And I'm going to focus quite a bit on looking at drought. And so one of the questions is, to what extent is the drought variability of the 20th century usual or recurrent? So I'm going to talk about my research both in the Great Plains and in the tropical Andes. These are both semi-arid regions where water availability is a major issue. They both experienced massive droughts in the 1940s. So again, one of the questions I want to address is to what extent are these major droughts that we've seen in the 20th century severe or unusual events, or are they just sort of part of natural climate variability? Now, in addition to using the um, geological as a tool with which to evaluate current trends. It also, in this case, has lots of implications for looking at other processes. So I'm going to use the climate record in the tropical South America to also look at the role of climate change in the evolution of biological systems and the potential role of climate change in human population and the dynamics of prehistoric cultures. History books that I read when I reconstruct history are the sediments in the bottom of lakes. So lakes are essentially collection basins that record the history of the environment around them. They receive oops, too sensitive. They receive material that comes in from the atmosphere, such as chemicals that are dissolved in rain, dust from the atmosphere. They get pollen from trees and vegetation surrounding the lake. They receive soils that are eroded in from the watershed. Material is also produced in the lake itself. And all of these things fall through the water column and give rise to the mud that you find in the bottom of lakes. So in that mud is essentially a sequential history of the atmosphere, of the watershed, and of the lake. So we have here a history. And as we go back from the top of the mud, back through the bottom, we're essentially looking at the history of the entire landscape. So what we do is we poke holes in these um, lake beds to reconstruct history by taking sediment cores. So in this little cartoon on the left, you're looking at a scene in which we're taking a core. So you just punch a simple tube down through the mud. The mud at the top is recent history. And as we go back through the mud, we're going back through time. In this particular image, it's an artist's rendition from Sweden of a nice pastoral Swedish scene coring from a frozen lake. This is what it really looks like, 10 below zero, <laughs> North Dakota, um, 
And then sometimes it's a little more Pacific. This is a scene coring in Peru from two rubber rafts and pushing down in between. So you take sediment cores, which look something like this. There are various tools for dating the mud. So you have a sequence again here from top to bottom, or actually I guess it's top to bottom in this case, but again, we're going back through history. And we can sample individual layers of these cores and analyze various constituents in the mud to tell us something about history. And so again, this is a history from recent times back into the past. Now, as I've said, my interest in this talk is looking at the reconstruction of precipitation variability or, or of drought. And I'm using lakes as recorders of that drought. So lakes respond to drought or to precipitation variation by changing both in their depth or their level and in their salinity. So when you have conditions such as you see on the left where there's a lot of evaporation, you evaporate off water, the lake becomes more shallow. In evaporating off water, you also leave salts behind. And so the lake becomes saltier. So again, this would be a, under a dry climate. If you take that same system and you increase the precipitation, such as in the right-hand figure, you increase the depth of the lake by rainfall, and you also dilute out the salt, so the lake becomes fresher. So in these ways, lakes respond to climate, and if we can find clues to these responses preserved in the mud, we can then reconstruct alternations between dry periods and wet periods. So this is just an example. Sometimes you can actually see these shifts visually in the mud that's preserved in lakes. So in the upper core, you actually have layers of salt that were deposited during times when the lake was very salty. In other words, layers that were deposited when it was quite arid. And then you have layers where there is no salt from times when the lake was fresher. So in this case, you can actually visually read the history by looking for layers where you have salt and those where you don't. My own research is largely, though, on a group of organisms called diatoms, which are a type of microscopic plant. So diatoms have cell walls that are made out of silica, essentially glass. And so when these organisms die, their silica cell walls um, preserve while their organic contents decompose. So again, you have these glass um, shells that fall down to the bottom of the lake and preserve through time. You can use the species composition of diatoms to infer what the conditions were like in the past. So different shapes indicate different environments. So in the upper figure, you have a circular form of diatom. You can see that these are lovely, lovely things to look at through the microscope. These circular forms grow free floating in the water. So they're indicative of deep water conditions. The types that are bilaterally symmetric or elongate are species that grow attached to rocks, attached to mud. Um, attached to plants, and so they're indicative of shallow water conditions. So simply the alternation between these two can indicate changes in water depth. There also are types that are indicative of saline conditions and others that are fresh. So you can see, for example, in this little cartoon, a situation where, in which we might infer changes in lake depth from diatoms. In the top, we have a deep lake. We have lots of the circular forms that are indicative of deep water. And again, they fall to the bottom and form part of the mud. If we then go to a drier climate, we have more of these elongate shallow water forms that are produced. And so they are the dominant signal. So again, by looking at alternations in different layers of mud between the circular forms and the elongate forms, we can reconstruct changes in lake depth through time. Now, as I indicated, what I'm going to do is talk about precipitation variability in two regions, the Great Plains and the tropical Andes. And at first glance, these might seem radically different. The towering heights of the Andes, which span more than 20,000 feet above sea level relative to the more gradual topography of the Nebraska region, are really quite different. But in fact, they actually have very similar precipitation ranges. So they both have precipitation amounts that span from a few hundred millimeters a year to about 800 millimeters a year. They're both semi-arid. They're both dominated by native grassland. And they both have a, a dominant agricultural economy, although clearly the um, agriculture in the tropical Andes is on a much smaller scale. But so they have a lot of similarities. I'm going to first talk about the Great Plains region, which is near to and dear to many of us. And so this is a photo of a small lake in eastern, North, or rather western North Dakota that we've generated some sediment records from. 
So this is the type of thing that I spend hours and hours looking at. But to walk you through it, what it is is a record of drought variability from a lake in the Dakotas for the last 1,000 years. So you're essentially looking at modern times here and going back 1,000 years. So these are samples that were taken from an individual core, again, going from modern times back in time. And here you're looking at a reconstruction based on diatoms of salinity or drought conditions through time. So things that fall up in this scale or have higher values on the y-axis are things that are typical of arid times, and things that fall lower on the y-axis are things that are typical of wet periods of time. We can use the Dust Bowl interval as a point of reference. So here are conditions during the bus Dust Bowl. And the basic question is, how recurrent are things such as droughts such as we see in the Dust Bowl times. And if we project back through this last 1,000 years, we can quite clearly see that droughts, the magnitude of the Dust Bowl, are recurrent and frequent events from this temp temporal perspective. There are indeed some intervals of time, such as the early 1800s and late 1700s, when um, drought was less frequent, when it was wetter on average. There are other intervals of time, such as the 16th century in here, when droughts, the magnitude of the Dust Bowl, were more frequent. But nonetheless, droughts are clearly recurrent. What's even more impressive, though, I think, about this record is this interval in time right back here from about 800 to 1,000 years ago. So in this interval, it's clear that most of the two centuries that it encompasses are characterized by major drought. So we have drought that's not only extreme or pronounced, at least, but also very persistent. So this puts the Dust Bowl droughts sort of in perspective, and there have indeed been droughts that have been much more prolonged within fairly recent geologic history. Now my colleagues here at Nebraska are working on similar sorts of records from the Nebraska sand hills, and this helps us to paint a wider spread picture of the extent of these droughts. I should go back to just say, so this period of time from about 800 to 1,000 years ago is often called the medieval time. So it was the medieval time in Europe, and that period has been, that name has been applied to other places on the globe. So my colleagues here at UNL have been studying the record in wetlands and dunes, um, looking at similar sorts of issues. And so what you're looking at here, so this is the work, I should say, of Jim Swinehart, Dave Luke, Ron Goebel, and a whole suite of other people that are interested in the history of the sand hills. So what you're looking at here is a I'm not very good at this yet. You're looking at a wetland complex in the Sandhill region. So this is a large complex of wetlands that's bordered on both sides by sand dunes that are covered in grass. So these colleagues took a series of cores through these wetland areas. And on the bottom figure, you can see they took a transept of cores here and here. And essentially, you would just flip that map um, sideways to have the same orientation as the photo. In taking these cores, they noticed that in the valleys, if we'll look at just maybe the focus on the bottom figure, in the valleys you have thick accumulations of peat. So this is essentially undecomposed organic material that's ac um, accumulating from these wetlands systems over time. So again, these very thick deposits of peat. But interbedded in the peat are thin layers of sand. You see one here, and you see another lens of sand here. And you can date these lenses of sand, and the most recent lens that you see interbedded in the peat dates from about 800 to 900 years ago, again, during the medieval period. So the scenario in this case is one in which you start out with a landscape in which you have dunes covered with vegetation, you have either wetlands or lakes in between the dunes. Then during the medieval period, extreme drought killed off the grass cover, such as you see here. It also dropped the water table in the wetlands. And in doing so, it allowed sand to migrate out across the valley, forming these thin layers of sand. Later, when the climate got wet again, you had the recurrence of wetland in the valleys and those deposited peat bearing these thin layers of sand. So in the sand hills, again, we have evidence um, in these wetlands of massive drought during medieval times that killed off the grass cover of the dunes. And I should note that during the Dust Bowl period, we did not have loss of dune grass cover in most regions. You can also see the same phenomena in cross sections of the sand hills. So what you're looking at here 
boy, you'd think a PhD would be able to get this, but <laughs> guess not. Um, so what you're looking at here is a modern soil that's forming under the grass cover of the modern um, dunes. And so this dark brown area is an organic rich soil. You can see a fossil soil down here, which is another organic rich um, unit. But in between these two soils is this massive expanse of sand. And again, you can date when this sand was deposited, and it dates from about 800 years ago in this particular case. So again, the medieval period. So we have extensive evidence in the Sand Hills region and in the Northern Plains, and indeed elsewhere in Western North America, that during the medieval period, between about 800 and 1,000 years ago, we had ex massive drought that was very prolonged for most of several centuries. So by that perspective, the Dust Bowl droughts are um, not only unusual, they're really quite small if we take this longer temporal view. We could also even take a longer viewpoint spanning back thousands of years, and in that context, even these um, medieval-style droughts are really somewhat mild. I'd like to move now to um, talking about precipitation variation in the tropical Andes, which is the other major place that I've worked. And so what you're looking at here is a shot from um, Bolivia on the shores of Lake Titicaca. In the left, you're seeing an image of some agricultural fields. In the right are the same fields from the same viewpoint um, during a year of extensive flooding that caused massive economic hardship. So in the case of studying the tropical Andes, one of the basic questions is the same. To what extent are these massive drought and flooding events recurrent? But we're also interested in this case in reconstructing climate so that we can look at both cultural change and the evolution of biodiversity. So in tropical South America, including both the Andes and the Amazon basin, there are a large number of species. So it's one of the real, what are called global biodiversity hotspots. And so there have been lots of questions that have been, or um, suggestions over the decades about the role that climate change may have played in fostering the evolution of high biodiversity. One of the hypotheses about the evolution of biodiversity in tropical South America proposed that during periods of time, specifically during the global ice ages, that the rainforest dried up. So this is showing you the modern expanse of rainforest in tropical South America and of tropical montane forest in dark green in the tropical Andes. And so in the 1960s, an ornithologist named Haffer proposed that during the ice ages, so meaning the times when ice, um, large ice caps covered north parts of North America and parts of Europe, he proposed that tropical South America became very dry. And as it dried, the rainforest contracted into these small islands that are shown here. And so he proposed that in these islands you had speciation occurring. So these islands occurred in areas where there still was some water. And then when it got wet again, after the um, demise of the ice ages, the rainforest expanded and you had the coalescence of these former islands of speciation. So he proposed that the high biodiversity of parts of tropical South America were a result of these massive climate shifts that caused the expansion and contraction of rainforest and um, the coalescence of these speciation islands or these refugia. Now he proposed this solely based on looking at distribution of modern birds and there was no evidence at all with which to evaluate was, the tropical, was tropical South America dry during the ice ages or not. So this is one of the questions that we hope to address. So basically he proposed that these evergreen tropical forests such as you see here um, when they dried up were replaced by dry forest being deciduous forest or else by savanna which is grassland with these sorts of trees. So we've been trying to evaluate whether or not ice ages were dry in tropical South America by looking at the sediments of lakes in um, the southern hemisphere. So we're looking at a region called the Altiplano, which is this high elevation plateau. It's located in the crook of South America here, and you can see the cloud-covered Amazon basin to the east. So I'm going to talk today about records from Lake Titicaca, which is a high elevation um, lake. It's about 3,800 meters in elevation. It's about 285 meters in depth. 
So it's a large, beautiful tropical lake system. And I'll also talk about a record from the Salar to Uyuni, which is a large salt flat, which is about 100 kilometers in um, diameter and is the largest salt flat in the world. Now, in coring Lake Titicaca with at 285 meters of water, you can't go out there with your little rubber rafts and core down between them. Um, it also doesn't freeze, so we had to use oceanographic um, ship. So what you're looking at here is a boat called the Nicho, which is, was outfitted at Woods Hole, shipped down through the Panama Canal to the coast of Chile, and then we had it trucked up to Lake Titicaca. And so we were able to use this to core and get records of um, the geologic past. As our point of reference, again, we're trying to put the 20th century in context. And so the modern Lake Titicaca has fluctuated about six meters in the 20th century. So in one of the early slides, I showed you massive 1940s-style droughts that occurred in the tropical Andes, and those resulted in the low lake level that you see here. I also showed you a photograph of flooding in the Titicaca drainage basin in the mid-1980s, and that point is shown here. So again, we have about a six meter amplitude difference between the low level and the high level, and this provides us with a yardstick. So what you're looking at here is a reconstruction of the last few thousand years of lake history from Lake Titicaca. So this orientation is actually the opposite of what I showed you previously. You're looking at high lake level up here and low lake level down here, and you're looking at modern times, in this case back about 4,000 years. The modern lake level is right up here, so anything down in this space is a departure from modern level. And so you can see that there's several intervals within the last few thousand years when lake level has been considerably lower than it has is in the modern day. In fact, about 20 meters lower than in the modern. So relative to the six meters of fluctuation that we've seen in the last century, this is substantial. Interestingly, the most recent of these fluctuations occurred about a thousand years ago, and it um, coincides with the demise of the Tiwanaku civilization on the shores of Lake Titicaca. So um, this was a pre-Incan civilization. It was extremely sophisticated. It had um, great monuments, fabulous artwork, and a very sophisticated agricultural system. So what you're looking at here is a recon reconstruction, or actually these fields are used now, but they had raised fields and then these canal systems adjacent to the raised fields. The canals were flooded with lake water. The canals then heated up during the day when there's high radiation, and then at night when it got cold, that radiation that was held in the water was released and kept the fields from freezing. And so again, this is a fairly sophisticated agricultural system. They raised a diversity of crops. You're looking at quinoa here, which is a high protein grain. They have had a whole diversity of um, potatoes that they cultivated. And this civilization was abandoned, or rather the settlement was abandoned, apparently abruptly about a thousand years ago. So our reconstruction of drought history here suggests that one of the co um, contributors to that abandonment of this settlement may have been climate variability and climate change. We've also gone further back in time. So the droughts that I just showed you are right down in here. And you can look back about, um, in this case, a period between about 8,000 and 4,000 years ago to see that drought was even more massive than during um, that decline of Tiwanaku culture. So to reorient you, this is one of these figures where I'm using diatoms to infer lake level. In this case, low lake levels up here, so this is dry conditions high lake levels down here, so this is wet conditions. So we have this period of time between about 8,000 and 4,000 years ago when clearly lake level was extremely low and um, drought was pronounced. There were prehistoric people living in the Andes at this time, and there are groups of archaeologists that are trying to understand what their settlement patterns might have been and how they might have responded to these major droughts. In addition to looking at diatoms in this case, we actually have physical evidence of the magnitude of these um, lake level declines about 8,000 years ago. So I'm going to show you some seismic and sonar images, which are basically techniques in which you shoot um, sound waves down through the water column 
these waves bounce off the bottom and allow you to image the um, nature of the bottom sediments or take a picture of the bottom sediments. So I'm going to show you an image from up here near the Juan Cane Delta, another one from along the side of Isla del Sol, and then a third one from he this small part of the lake. So Lake Titicaca has two basins. It's got this large northern basin, which is the very deep one, again, 285 meters in depth. And then this small basin to the south is very shallow, generally only about 10 meters. And the two are, are connected right through here by something called the Straits of Tequina. And so again, water flows from the north basin southward through this narrow strait into the southern basin presently. So what you're looking at here, again, is an image of the lake bottom. So this is a transect that's taken up here in the northern part of the lake where the Juan Cane River comes into the lake. And you can see in the lake bottom up in that northern part these large channel systems that are eroded into the bottom of the um, modern lake surface. This is essentially a river channel. And when it was formed, clearly it was well above the level of the lake. So what happened when this system was formed is basically that all of this area in this part of the lake was dry and the Juan Cane River advanced out over the dried um, lake basin after lake level had dropped. These channels are about 50 meters in this particular image below the modern lake surface. And so clearly lake level must have dropped at least 50 meters at the time these were formed. And we actually have other evidence elsewhere that suggests that in some places lake level may have been 100 meters lower than um, modern. So again, in this interval between about 8,000 and 4,000 years ago, we have massive drought causing something on the order of a 50 to 100 meter decline in lake level. These are terraces on the side of that island that I showed you in the southern part of the lake. So these terraces were essentially formed as lake level dropped and stabilized for a period of time, and the wave cut action etched a terrace into the side along this lake. And so again, we can measure the elevation of these terraces and calculate how much lake level declined from its modern level to the lowest of the terraces that we see. So again, just very clear physical evidence of these massive lake level declines between 8,000 and 4,000 years ago. So this is a map of the modern lake system, and you can see the large northern basin, the small southern basin, and we can actually then take that physical evidence that we've seen in the seismic and the sonar data of a 50 to 100 meter lake level drop and figure out how, how the size of Lake Titicaca would have changed. And so this is an image of what Lake Titicaca would have been during that interval, so massive, massive um, decline in lake Size. So again, if we go back, you can see that all the dark blue areas of the small lake and around the large lake dried up. And so the lake at that time was a, a, only a fraction of its present size. So again, 8,000 to 4,000 years ago, we had these massive lake level declines that completely dried up the small basin of the lake. Then something about 3,500 years ago, precipitation began to rise and lake level began to rise as well. And in doing so, we eventually flooded the sill, the Straits of Tequina, so that the large lake and the small basin were filled and connected. And then precipitation continued to rise to the present day on average, and then eventually the lake overflowed. But we also have some images of the process of going from this low lake stage to this intermediate stage in which we had flooding from the large lake to fill the small lake. So here you're looking at a sonar image. The big lake is up here. The small lake is down here. So again, as lake level began to rise in response to precipitation change, you had the flooding from the large lake through the Straits of Tequina into this small lake system. And as that flooding occurred, it etched this river channel in what's now uh, the bottom of the lake and below about 40 meters of water. So in these images and in the diatom data, we have evidence of both the massive um, lake level decline and also the filling after, after the fact. Well, one of the original questions I posed was, what about Ice Age South America? Was the ice, were the ice ages dry? 
And this is a record that you've seen before, so shallow conditions here, deep conditions here, and this is a diatom reconstruction. In this case, though, we're going back 30,000 years. And the maximum of the last glacial period in the northern hemisphere was about 20,000 years ago. And so at that time, it's quite clear that Lake Titicaca was very deep and very fresh. So if we go back to the question that Haffer posed, was the ice age, were the ice ages dry? Indeed, they were not dry. They were quite wet based on these data. So during the last glacial maximum, Lake Titicaca was its present size. It actually can't get any deeper. So we have a river that flows out of the um, small basin of the lake. So flow goes from the northern basin into the southern basin. And if you increase precipitation on that lake, you actually in just increase flow out the river system. So the lake can't get any um, larger than it presently is. But we actually have evidence from to the region to the south that not only was it wet, during the last glacial period in the tropical Andes, but it actually was much wetter than present. So I'm going to show you some data from the Salar de Uyuni, which is this large salt flat, again, just to the south of Lake Titicaca. So the modern Salar looks something like this. It's a truly dramatic landscape, this very expansive salt flat. We've actually drilled down. There are layers of mud beneath the present salt. And so we've actually done drilling to reconstruct history. But I don't have time to show you those data today. What I will show you, though, are just some, again, very clear physical evidence of a massive change in lake level. You're looking here at some paleo shorelines. So these are ancient shorelines from a time when the, um, this basin was filled with water and was a large, deep lake. These shorelines are 140 meters above the modern dry salar surface. So in other words, we had a lake here that was 140 meters in depth. And they date from the last glacial maximum. So not only was um, the last age, ice age wet, it was considerably wetter than the modern day. So this is a little cross section. You have Lake Titicaca up here. And you have the modern salar um, surface down here covering this particular area to the south. If we were to put a lake, which apparently existed, of 140 meters in depth in this basin, it would have covered this entire area shown here. So much of the region between the modern Lake Titicaca and the Salar de Uyuni would have been flooded, again, with a very large, deep lake system. So this tells us that um, Happer was not right that the global ice ages, in, in this case, were wet, not dry. More recently, we drilled in Lake Titicaca to get a longer um, period history, going back even longer. And what I'm showing you here is our drill rig on the lake. So it was um, made out of um, shipping containers. So you're looking at three shipping containers here. It was a three by three matrix of containers with the drill stem that went down the middle. So we shipped our equipment in these containers from the US down to the coast of Chile. Those containers there were then trucked up um, to the side of Lake Titicaca. We emptied the equipment out of the containers. And then that floating platform was fit, formed by putting styrofoam in and then large air bladders to form the floating platform that we drilled from. So in that drilling, we've recovered a record that goes back about 400,000 years. And I'm only going to show you a portion of that. But again, you're looking at a record of dry conditions up here with values up here, wet conditions down here. That massive drought that dropped lake level 50 to 100 meters is here. The last glacial maximum wet period is in here. But if we go back about 125,000 years, we see evidence of massive and prolonged drought that's even more extreme than what we've seen before. So this period, again, of 125,000 years ago has takes us yet another order of magnitude higher in terms of a persistent and massive drought. And if we, we have physical evidence of the um, extent of that drought as well, it apparently dropped lake level about 200 meters below its modern elevation. So this is a large grand lake system that presently is 285 meters deep. If we drop it by 200 meters, its aerial extent would have been much reduced and approximating something as you see in yellow here. So on these, what are really relatively short time frames for a geologist, 
we've seen this large lake system undergo these massive changes in level in which it's um, shrunk from a large glorious lake system surrounded by um, um, tropical mountains to a very small lake that would have been relatively shallow. So if we ask again, if we revisit um, Happer's proposal that were the ice ages dry, no, clearly they were not. But he was actually right in um, a gen more general sense in that it's quite clear that there have been massive, massive precipitation swings in this part of tropical South America, and undoubtedly these massive precipitation swings had an impact on biodiversity. So we have evidence on short time scales of the last thousand years of declines of 20 meters. We have evidence over an 8,000, during a period about 8,000 years ago, of lake level declines of about 80 meters. And we have evidence that 125,000 years ago, lake level declined 200 meters. And these actually occurred during warm periods in the northern hemisphere, not during cold periods. But nonetheless, they're pronounced. And then we also have evidence of a much wetter period about um, 20,000 years ago. So again, I think Haffer was wrong in the specifics, but he was right in a very general sense that this region has under undergone massive precipitation swings. So what this does is it provides a context for evolutionary biologists who are interested in the role of climate variability in fostering evolutionary processes. So for example, my biology colleague, Guillermo Ortiz is studying the evolution of Amazonian fish. And he might then look at radiation in fish from his um, data and evaluate whether or not some of those patterns are associated with um, climate change, such as depicted here. So these data in and of themselves, as I said, provide us with a context for looking at the evolution of the Earth system in other contexts. Why else might we care about tropical South America? Well, some model predictions suggest that the tropics are the regions that are going to see the most um, extreme climate shifts in the next century as a result of increased greenhouse gases. So what you're looking at here are two um, model predictions similar to ones I showed you before, but these are model predictions of the amount of climate change in the 20th century or 21st century relative to modern times. So these are, again, climate models which have put in two different scenarios of expected greenhouse gas concentrations, one high in A, one lower in B. They predicted climate of the 21st century and then said, how different is that climate than the modern? And so dark areas are showing climate that's very different than um, modern times. So you can see, again, that there's massive, massive climate change predicted for tropical regions. Some have even gone so far as to suggest that these climate changes that we see in the tropics may well impact the globe, including us. So tropical forests clearly take up carbon dioxide. And if we kill off tropical forests by um, producing drought in tropical regions, we would leave that CO2 in the atmosphere. So again, some climate modelers produce that or suggest that atmospheric greenhouse gas concentrations will be even higher as a result of climate change than they would be without that climate variability. Regardless of whether those specific predictions are true, it's clear that we live in a globally interconnected environment. And it's certainly true that the developed worlds have produced much of the greenhouse gases that are causing climate change. And they are hence impacting these less developed countries, such as Bolivia or Peru. So I would argue that we really bear some responsibility to be concerned about climate variability, because even natural climate variability has a pronounced influence on the livelihoods of these people. So that basically brings me to an end. So to summarize, what I think I've tried to show you is that droughts, the equivalent of the Dust Bowl period, were recurrent and are a recurrent and natural part of climate variability, both in tropical South America and in the Great Plains and much of Western North America. And so given that these are a natural and recurrent part of climate variability on very short time scales, I think it's imperative that we manage our water resources with that recognition in mind. And clearly, we don't do that. It's also clear that within very recent periods of time that there have been droughts that are much, much more prolonged than those of the last century. And again, 
These droughts are part of human experience. There were people in the Great Plains. There were people in the Andes when we had these massive um, droughts of the medieval period. But it's also clear that we're very poorly prepared to deal with anything of that magnitude. And should these kinds of droughts recur, that the consequences would be disastrous. So these data on the recent environmental past or the geologic past don't really allow us to predict what's going to happen in the future. But again, I would argue that they give us a much better sense for how the Earth works in stages that are different than the modern times. And given that the future environment may well be very different than that that we know, it may well be more like worlds long gone by than worlds that we've experienced in the last century, I think these sorts of geologic data are important. So in environmental sciences, as in many parts of the human endeavor, I think our ability to deal with the unknown future and the surprises that we're likely to encounter in that future are really enhanced by knowing something about history and by applying that history to how we live our daily lives and how we deal with the global environment. Thanks. probably millions in that size of soil. I'm only counting a fraction of those. Or rather, these days I'm not counting any of them. My students are counting them. But um, <laughs> typically we count something on the order of 500 individuals in a particular sample. We have done studies, and all of us have done studies multiple times on trying to figure out to what extent that small, small sample represents that environment. What, to what extent that one sample represents something else, to what extent does a core in one place represent what happened in another location. So there are a whole suite of sampling issues yeah, that you have to um, address, but diatoms are extremely productive and prolific. Um, so it depends on the system that you're looking at. So some lakes accumulate mud very rapidly, and you may even be able to resolve seasonal changes in um, production and conditions. Other lakes accumulate much more slowly, and so there may be cases in which you can resolve decades. So Arctic lakes, for example, don't produce very much in either the lakes or the landscape. So resolution is low because they don't accumulate much through time. In these particular systems, um, Great Plains lakes are great production systems. They um, accumulate a lot. We can easily resolve a year. In most cases, we don't have the um, time to actually analyze all these samples. So a single sample takes several hours to count. Um, I'm forcing my, diet, my students are analyzing thousands, over 1,000 samples from an individual site, so commonly with a resolution of about five to 10 years. So usually that's an integrated sample. So usually we would take a chunk and integrate five years and analyze that as an integrated picture of a five-year slice. But 
again, um, in Lake Titicaca, we're not, in that case, we're probably integrating about 100 years at a time, maybe, slight, maybe 50, something on that order. Yeah, your obser observation is right on target. So in many parts of Western North America, the um, settlement time was perhaps we might say anomalously wet, but it certainly was very wet. And so um, as Sandy Zelmer can tell you, there are lots of um, parts of water law that were codified in the decades when we had high precipitation. And so the sort of expectation about what normal conditions or normal river flow might be were based on, again, experience, which in this case was a time period in which we had a lot of precipitation and probably more than usual. And so there's a lot of evidence, not just ours, there's tree ring data from the Colorado River Basin. And I think a lot of it points to the fact that some of the early decades of the 20th century were very wet compared to even a few hundred year average. And so, yeah, very clearly, I think there's a need to reassess some of the things that we may be doing in terms of what might be usual and what might be um, more typical. Yeah, there's lots of stuff that's in there, um, both inorganic and organic. And in this, for, in, just for simplicity, I chose only to talk about the diatoms. Um, I have colleagues that are analyzing basic various geochemical proxies that basically back up the conclusions from the diatoms. In some cases, we're looking at ostracods, which are small microcrustaceans, which have a calcium carbonate cell wall. And again, you can use those in a similar sense. Um, people are looking at pollen to look at vegetation history among, uh, in the landscape. So in all of these cases, we have other kinds of indicators that basically back up the conclusions of the diatoms in terms of what the lake system was. And then one of the interesting questions is you can then take the lake system and say, we know the lake was going up and down. We know climate was doing this. We could actually look at pollen as an independent proxy and say, OK, well, so what happened to vegetation on the landscape at the time when we know precipitation was going up and down based on um, a lake record. But in the best cases, you always want to have multiple lines of evidence that corroborate your story because there are biological differences in how all these systems work. And indeed, there are cases where they don't all concur or they don't concur if you take a very simple model of how the system works. And so. My training is actually as an ecologist, not as a geologist. And so I think one of the interesting things is starting to, is sort of using the geologic record. You can actually look at cases where two proxies don't tell you the same thing, form a hypothesis of why, about why that might not occur, or why that might occur, and then investigate modern systems to sort of see if you can refine your understanding of what the biology and what the biological systems are responding to. So. It's a nice iterative, iterative process, I think. So. Thank you. Sherry, are anthropologists asking for your data as they begin to try to solve the mysteries of the rise and fall of great civilizations? Yeah, so there are several groups of archaeologists that are working in the Titicaca drainage basin and that are actively sort of interacting with us to try to um, couple our data with theirs. So there's a group of people at San Diego, um, or Santa Barbara rather, that are working on settlement patterns in that period between about 10,000 years ago and um, 4,000 years ago to see how people, where people were during those massive drought years. They're focusing in particular on some of the river systems that go into Lake Titicaca to see if people were settled 
in um, the river valleys where water may have still been abundant at the time when um, lake level went down. But yeah, there's a lot of um, active interest and also potential for even more interchange to look at how these um, systems co-evolved. Sure, I mean, we think that in the Great Plains, we like to think that our weather is more variable than in other parts of the world. Does that hold up from a paleo perspective? When you get together with your paleo buddies from all over the world, is our story more dramatic or is it dramatic everywhere? I actually think it's, I think it's pretty dramatic in a lot of locations. So even, um, you know, variability is in the eye of the beholder and it depends on your time scale. But, I mean, clearly the tropical Andes is highly variable. I've worked recently, as you know, in Greenland and there's a, there's a lot of variability and I think particularly in the case of hydrology, there are massive, massive hydrological shifts on fairly short time frames in lots of places. I mean, even in Greenland when I was working there where you have, you know, ice covered lakes for nine months of the year, you still have these really massive hydrological systems. Um, in this week's Scarlet, my um, former student Jeffrey Stone has a, he's now working on Lake Malawi in Africa. They're documenting mega droughts there about 75,000 years ago in which lake level dropped even several hundred meters and which they're hypothesizing impacted the um, migration of people out of Africa. But, um, so this, it's all a matter of time scale, but I, what I'm continually impressed with is at least in terms of precip variability is that even you don't have to go very far back to see pretty high variability systems in a lot of kinds in a lot of kinds of landscapes and I'm not working in temperate North America but in a lot of these semi arid arid regions or even Arctic regions it's certainly pronounced we have time for maybe one more Not necessarily. So actually the model is a little more complex in the sense that probably if you have sufficient water to suspend these diatoms, the deep water ones stay. What happens is you have more shallow, you have more light. These are photosynthetic organisms, so they require light for um, their livelihood. So as lake level drops, you have more of the lake bottom that's exposed to light. So it's basically a proportional argument where you get more production of the shallow water forms and so they swamp out the deep water forms um, in falling to the bottom simply because the benthic ones are more active. So you don't kill off the um, deep water ones until you drop lake level such that there's not enough turbulence to keep them in suspension. Basically, yes, is the, the range between the deep and the shallow diatom. Right, so we're basically just looking at the proportion of shallow water ones relative to deep water ones, and when the lake gets shallow, you proportionately get more of the shallow things. And so, and it's actually more complicated than that. All lakes don't behave in such a simple manner, but again, we have some models to try to understand how those things are related. Well, unfortunately, 